So let's go uh, into our uh, webinar uh, to learn about basics, interactive discussion of cases, their imaging workup, their findings and diagnosis, and your contribution We really ask you if you see uh, one of our cases, look at, uh, the, uh, at the clinical intro and then analyze the image and write into the chat right on. Uh, we are anonymous, so it is for you very free just to test if you uh, catch the right diagnosis. If it is very easy for you, it doesn't mind, so be more precise. We are very happy for uh, chat contributions. They are, let's say, the backbone of our work. Um, I would like, in the beginning, uh, this is not uh, refined to uh, acute abdomen, this webinar, but I would like to remind that uh, the sonography of the acute abdomen uh, concentrates of some pathologic findings uh, which can be depicted very quickly and uh, this uh, is one of the uh, most advantages of uh, sonography to be cheap, to be quick and uh, can be done immediately when the patient arrives even before CT. And a uh, biliary colic, renal colic, restylation of the gallbladder or the bile ducts, a hydronephrosis, stones, uh, uh, this is one of the, these are one of the most important findings. Uh, free fluid in the abdomen as well as fluid in the uh, retroperitoneum, which is uh, very difficult sometimes to depict for rupture of the aorta, usually state of RTCT, but nevertheless to see free fluid sometimes we, uh, it is uh, very suggestive and uh, also for the emergency radiology really important diagnosis, of course, especially in children and younger patients, appendicitis and diverticulitis is a little bit more difficult to see a thickened uh, bowel wall. But let's uh, start and uh, we have case one. So what we see here on uh, case one is a young lady with a clinical problem. It's a 20 years old woman, has a colicky pain and a palpable mass in the middle of the abdomen. And there is a, uh, there was an operation, it was an uh, appendectomy some, uh, some years ago. There uh, is no fever and the palpable mass is uh, is somewhat mobile and the emergency uh, radiologist uh, was performing sonography and found in the region of the palpable mass this finding and um, a little bit more deeper the other finding so I would be very uh, interested what uh, are your suggestions in the chat? Do we have? Uh, at the moment, not yet. So I would... Maybe we are facing some technical issues here. Uh, if you have a look on your screen, you should see uh, a bar on the right-hand side usually. Yeah, there we go. So two colleagues already found it. Uh, one more, okay. Uh, there's a suggestion that it says uh, dilated small bowel loop. Which one? Uh, so at last uh, could be both images, could be small bowel loops. Or an ileus. So yes. a binary bladder is another suggestion and another one is adhesive ileus. Brighton as well. So it's very... The image on the bottom to answer to the question you asked before. Yeah. So, we have already good suggestions and uh, when I help you a little bit, uh, what we are, what we will bring to you, but now we are relying on images, what we will bring to you will be uh, dynamic 
sonography by time, but these are only images, so it's difficult for you. Sonography is a dynamic investigation. And here you see that this liquid hypoechogenic structure is exactly below the skin. And this is a round fluid filled structure. And here we see that the wall, the, mar the marcated wall, is going into the deeps, the depths, and near to this, uh, near to this structure, we see another completely hypoechogenic area, which might be a peripheral fluid to this structure, and then more deeper. This I have to help you. This uh, is the subcutaneous layer. This is the abdominal wall, and deeply we have, as uh, already suggested, a dilated fluid-filled bowel wall. And what you cannot see, of course, is the fact that we have um, uh, we have an upper stalsis in both areas where pathologic finding, findings could be seen, and we saw some more of those loops. So we have in the subcutaneous region where the palpable mass is, a fluid filled structure which might be bowel and more deeper. So ileus is a good suggestion, but do we have something more? We have more? another one which says hernia. Yes. No further specification here. Of course, it is difficult to specify uh, uh, the location of a hernia. For this, you would have to be the uh, sonographer, and uh, that brings us forward to the next uh, to the next slide. Uh, already stated, fluid-filled uh, uh, loops with upper stalsis. There is surrounding fluid, and all that is leading to the consumption that this should be an incarcerated hernia, and these are the sonographic signs of incarceration. Uh, as well, if you use color doppler, if there is not too much, uh, not, uh, too much uh, hemodynamics, but this is very difficult and only in severe hands uh, to advise. Uh, Intraperitoneal loop shows as well upper stalsis and this fluid field. So that was the correct diagnosis of the colleagues that we see here the sonography uh, in, uh, in a, whether this is an ileus and from the position it was a little bit left to the middle. So uh, finally, it is an uh, the diagnosis of this case is an incisional hernia. That means a secondary hernia, which uh, occurs in 20 to 10 to 20% after laparotomy. And for the secondary, uh, for the secondary hernias, we have some predisposing factors. I um, mention here only if, of course, if you have wound healing disorders, so the mechanics of the uh, incision uh, will be weaker, of course, wound healing disorders. Then, of course, uh, a, a, a big subcutaneous compartment in adipositas, emergency operations, of course, diabetes, which in turn is uh, leading to wound healing disorders. Alexander, what do you think about this case? Would you have any additional comments? Mm, well, I think that's a nice case to show that uh, ultrasound is uh, good also to evaluate the bowel because most, most as a student I thought ultrasound and sonography um, for imaging of the bowel system is not very helpful. I learned a lot about that and I think these cases describe a very good finding uh, about hernias. Um, but I think if there is no explanation about where the picture is taken, it's quite difficult to say yeah. um, where to find this hernia on the bowel and which, uh, yeah, which tissue was visualized. Of course. So it's very important to, uh, to give some hints 
to bridge uh, that uh, to be a little bit more realistic. Okay, are there um, There's a question coming in right now uh, which says how can you be sure that the area next to the lumen is fluid and not air? Um, this is very easy. Uh, if you look a little bit more down, you see some uh, dirty looking inhomogeneous parts of the picture. If this would be air, uh, you would have uh, almost total reflection of the sonographic uh, of the sonographic uh, uh, loudness, and then the most of the beam is reflected. So that means that the ultrasound, if it is totally refle reflected, cannot uh, produce images uh, more down, uh, more uh, more more intern image. And if it is completely black, that means that uh, the ultrasound could move directly through. Uh, this uh, this part and is only reflected in parts here in the region of the wall. That means if you see fluid, it's completely black. And uh, there are some tissues like lymphoma; they can mimic fluid, but usually fluid is present when it is completely black and when the ultrasound can pass uh, without any hindrance through a compartment. So that is the reason why we uh, can diagnose it as fluid as well in the bowel loop. So some of you might say, well, but the, the other image shows uh, gray, uh, shows gray compartment, and this is the bowel loop. Here are the Kirkering folds, and in the center of the lumen, it is more gray than black. Why? Because we have such a big distance from the skin into the middle of this loop that we are not really able to depict it in that super quality like up here, but this is subcutaneous, so we are some millimeters below the skin surface. And here, black is black, hypoechoic is, is let's say, non-echoic, whereas here, fluid is more difficult to depict. It's a very easy trick to uh, come along with that, you just go down with the ultrasound probe to the bladder because in the bladder almost always, if there is not blood or, blood or tumor within, you have, a, uh, you have, let's say, a comparable structure, what is fluid. And then, um, beautifully described also in the book of Alexander Sachs, is how to adjust the probe, how to, uh, to go technically in the, uh, in, in, into the, the right um, into the right uh, imaging quality. So, but this was a good question. Is there some? No. Okay. Perhaps another hint, just if you're uh, not sure how deep you are with the image, just look at the diameter on the side. You see these little dots here, and between two dots, the, um, the, uh, the measurement is one centimeter. And if you go here, you see it's like five centimeters to here. And if you compare it to the picture below, you are like 10 centimeters deep. It's a very uh, important remark. Thank you, Alex. And in some machines show you the five millimeters as a small mark, but you have always orientation numbers helping you for this. Okay, if there is no further comment, I would say the next patient is waiting, but before that, I would like uh, to show you another hernia. Um, just as an example of a primary hernia, which is very common, you will find in, the, in many patients, and is clinically easy to uh, evaluate, is the umbilical hernia. The umbilical hernia, you can palpate in the umbilicus, uh, take gloves, because uh, this is a, uh, sometimes a problematic area of hygienic, uh, in, in terms of hygienic situation, and you have really to go deep into the umbilicus uh, to palpate there. Don't hurt the patient, but you will then palpate if something is sliding back and forward, but sometimes it is difficult and, you, uh, and often you cannot depict the size um, of the defect. And this is a classical hernia, but this is a not complicated hernia. So it is not, I cannot show you the peristalsis, which was easily shown, but here you can see this small three centimeter 
uh, well circumscribed uh, hernia and there is no fluid within the bowel and not in the periphery of the bowel. You see the umbilicus, I was putting jelly directly in the umbilicus because if there would be air in the umbilicus you could not see and what you see here, this is not a normal sonogram, this is a CT sonogram where you switch the probe in a special mode over the surface of the skin and then you have a very long image and this is very good for training. Here you see the muscle layer, this is the fat and these are the fat uh, compartments, the little lobules and exactly here beautifully depictable the uncomplicated umbilical hernia. So we have seen the complicated with the ileocid here, the uncomplicated hernia. So moving on to a much more difficult case. This is a 40 years old female. I mean to a routine exam and the resident was uh, looking for an older colleague, elder colleague to help with this image and you might help the colleague or yourself, what this could be. First question, what structure is that in the abdomen? We have here the subcutaneous layer, we have here the muscle layer. Okay, we already have an answer, it says gallbladder with a thick and wall. Exactly. And now it is becoming interesting. This is the gallbladder. That's correct. This is the liver should be the fifth segment or fourth segment uh, from the uh, liver and this is a sharp margin, liver seems normal but here we have a wall thickening and how is the inner lumen of the gallbladder is shaped like something we know very good from Microsoft. What do we know from Microsoft? Hmm? Alexander? <laughs> you are looking at it. That's a very interesting question. <laughs> so It's the hourglass. You know what is an hourglass? Okay. This is what our grandfathers had to measure time or the grand grand grandfather. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the lumen here is like an hourglass. This is the Microsoft sign. I, would <laughs> I do not like I don't get money from them, but this is the hourglass sign. So uh, the lumen which is completely hypoechoid and the wall is circumscribed so that means annular, it is in a certain region of the, of the gallbladder. Here the gallbladder wall is thin and here it is markedly thicker and this is another image but this is exactly in the direction of the length of the gallbladder lumen and this downward is at the level of the stenosis um, it's a cross-sectional and this is a classical situation because the question is what this can be. This has of course a differential diagnosis but we would have to speak about it a little bit. What do you think what that is? Are there? I know there was only a, a remark about the gold bladder sludge. Well, now, but uh, there's a suspicious tumor growth um, if vascularization is present. Of uh, course you see a differential diagnosis tumor if there is something thickened always of course you cannot rule out uh, easily that this is a tumor. Also there's another tip that says chronic cholecystitis chronic local cholecystitis, which is local on, on uh, this special well, of course I cannot rule out it, uh, but there is something, we, are, we, we hear the most important things, inflammation, tumor, but almost every organ has some specialities and this one as well has the specialities. I will show of course the images of the more common disease. Uh, just wait a little bit, I have to go for something for a piece of paper. Well in the time to answer about the sludge, why couldn't it be sludge? 
um, if you have sludge in the gallbladder, it won't be on both sides. It will go on the uh, on the lowest point of the gallbladder hinge length, and it will be located here. Mm -hmm. It may be look the same like shady, but uh, this is not typical for sludge. Uh, Alexander, you will show the sludge then from the chapter because I write down <laughs> what we cannot show but should show, and uh, I have the chapter as a PDF, uh, the gallbladder bladder chapter, and then we will describe the sludge later on. So, other comments now? Uh, there's a comment saying compression of popular artery uh, by uh, pancreas tumor. Uh, it's uh, this is the region, and the cross-sectional uh, cut makes up. This is a good idea. It's a good idea. But I think we should move on. This is an adenomyomatosis of the gallbladder. This is a kind of mucosal hypoplastic, maybe chronic inflammatory process, but this is benign, and the adenomyomatosis. Uh, is not very, but somewhat rare to see. But you should keep in mind that there are local thickenings of the gallbladder which are benign, and this is benign, and this is the annular type. You can have it locally, then it is in the fundus. You have then a thickened fundus. So it's called then the adenomyoma of the fundus. It could be generalized. Then you have an adenomyomatosis of the whole gallbladder, and this has to be differentiated from acute cholecystitis. It is most in most of the patients asymptomatic. In some of the patients, you can have right uh, right uh, upper quadrant pain, but uh, we cannot uh, say if this is produced by the disease uh, itself. It could be another reason too, and it is, to my uh, experience an incidental finding and uh, often operated uh, for security reasons. Uh, it is combined with stones and of course it has the differential diagnosis which was, uh, which was given properly by the colleagues. It is of course differential diagnosis. This in combination with a positive sonopalpation is acute cholecystitis. So this is a more or less thickening, homogeneous, somewhat. But we have the uh, we have the wall of the gallbladder in uh, divided into uh, different layers. We have a marked thickening over four millimeters, and uh, together with pain and especially pain during palpation, it is easily to suggest acute cholecystitis as it was proven in this case. You want to comment on this? Um, well, perhaps to the picture before, uh, one differential was tumor, if I remember right. Yeah. Uh, why isn't that a tumor? Um, because, okay, can you go yep. to the picture and back, please? If you look, um, or I suppose that's a tumor, you must have a look if other organs are compressed. For example, if the tumor is growing into the liver or into the, um, yeah, or whatever is surrounding the gallbladder. And here, actually, we don't see a sign of that. So it might be a process which is localized in the gallbladder. But of course, the differential must be there. Yeah, very good comment. So this is, uh, keep that in mind. This is your work, uh, if you are working in an emergency department. Our friends from the emergency department, they are doing the sonography as we do it. So this is a common shared method and everyone should be, uh, should be aware of it. So diffuse wall sickening, somewhat inhomogeneous and a painful palpation. If you look, uh, not now, but um, we will then uh, look again at the, uh, at the uh, homepage uh, key image. There you saw a gallbladder with surrounding fluid and some stripes and, uh, and shaggy structures. And this is a perforated gallbladder. Always, if you have fluid around the gallbladder, this suggests perforation, but has to be differentiated from ascites, of course, which can be somewhat tricky in, 
patients with uh, liver disease. So I will come uh, come back then to the perforation uh, the perforation uh, slide or image. Okay. Uh, we have a question yeah. here to the image uh, which is shown right now. Um, is the round structure slightly to the left below part of the liver, like a hemangioma or FNH? This? Yes. Uh, this is the uh, this is the upper pole of the right kidney. Okay. Uh, this is the upper pole of the right kidney in the uh, cross-sectional uh, standard section. So uh, now we have three questions. I am eager to to go to the textbook, but I will go on a little bit. Then after the gallbladder, we will uh, we will solve these questions by showing the appropriate images. We are going now to the differential diagnosis, not in the quiz style, not to lose too much time. What we have here is a very difficult diagnosis, which often is done in the uh, is done by surgery, and this is the carcinoma of the gallbladder. Uh, to differentiate it from the chronic uh, cholecystitis or the myriasis syndrome is extremely difficult, because. The gallbladder, if it is contracted and sickened wall, very rarely, I saw it only once in my life, you see such a beautiful tumor-like situation. And then we look back to our fluid-filled adenomyomatosis in a gallbladder carcinoma. Rarely, of course, you can find a, a polypoid tumor which shows you um, that situation. But carcinoma of the gallbladder it has a very poor prognosis and usually it is detected very late and cholecystitis be differentiated from chronic cholecystitis in many cases, especially cannot be differentiated from the Mirizzi syndrome. Um, maybe you have heard of it. This is compression of the extrahepatic bile ducts by inflammation, by chronic inflammation. You will hear from that later on. So, um, I would say before we move to this case, we should briefly, uh, not to forget, we should briefly look at, uh, at the already asked questions. So we go to the slash. So maybe Alexander would be so kind and explain this beautiful image of the sludge, but here we have the normal gallbladder, normal gallbladder, fluid filled, and here we see the common bile duct, should be around or lesser than six millimeters. This is uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to estimate, but this is in the normal range. Here we have MRCP, here we have different situation of stones. I will not focus now. Very important if you want to see stones, is to turn the patient and stones move and polyps don't. Here you see the stones and x-ray, multiple little, uh, little stones, and now we are here in the sludge area. And Alexander, the question was sludge. Please comment on that. Yes, yeah, so here you see beautiful pictures also from the clinics. Um, compared to the ultrasound image, if we go just back one uh, one picture on the upper part, to see these multiple mini stones here in the CT scan, or very nicely in the X-ray scan here too. And if it's like a fluid mass within with multiple stones inside, we call it sludge. And here you see it moves to the lowest point of the gallbladder. And this is how it looks. Like if you do an operation, if the surgeon um, just puts the gallbladder out, and this is the um, remark of sludge in clinical way. And the right image shows us that sludge can mimic tumor. Tumor effective sludge is a very difficult thing. So you see, at last, it's a very hard professional work to get uh, um, to get the right experience to be very severe with sonography, but just to find pathology, which is the first step, that is not so tricky. So the next question was the perforation of the 
um, the perforation of the gallbladder, or this was a, a wish. And then the then um, the, uh, the 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 normal anatomy. Okay, so we go now to another chapter. We go to the liver. This is the liver. Here is the right kidney, and if we cross with the beam in the right angle to this image, then we see this round structure we already uh, had had in our uh, PowerPoint, which was this one. This is the right kidney compared with um, uh, with what we have seen already. This is the second important cross, uh, it's more an oblique cross section with the portal vein, the common bile duct. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to show with the arrow, but uh, yeah, now it is more visible. Here we see the gallbladder. This is uh, a sagittal liver uh, cut. Um, the uh, number D. This is oblique, which shows the liver veins. This is number E. And F shows us the portal fork. This is uh, the, uh, just the division into the right and the left liver lobe. So we go, uh, we go now back to our uh, next case. And now we have another situation. I will disclose you what we see. We have a 70-year-old female, and the clinical problem is just cholestasis and right upper quadrant pain. And what is this? There's two suggestions already came in. Three, actually. Uh, the first one and the second one both say it's intrahepatic bilateral tract dilatation. Uh, uh, the comments, I don't know. Obstruction may be due to central mass in the liver, hyperechoic, not well circumscribed mass in the central part of the image could be tumor or metastasis. Uh, the suggestion is HCC or stone. Okay, so usually in uh, usually in the United States, they are far away, but they would be called home run, huh? <laughs> I would say this is a home run. Uh, but I like it. This is this is the beautiful um, this is the beautiful thing in interaction. Uh, the audience really takes part, and we thank for this good comment. So we give a little bit more information. These true comments are reflected in this beautiful uh, MRCP. Here we have the sonographic image. This is the liver. Here are portal veins and bile ducts. So many ducts one next to the other here parallel means this is portal vein and bile duct. This is the double duct, but not a double duct sign. This is another sign, but this is, uh, it is like a, uh, like this guns with the small, with a lot of small uh, bullets. I'm not a gun specialist, but in, in, in Germany I would know the Schrotflinten <laughs> yeah. no, it no, in English. But it's dilated bile ducts. And uh, beautifully mentioned in the chat, there is a central hypoechoic blur, um, mass with blurring margins. This mass has blurring margins, is inhomogeneous, echo, poor echo. This is the classical sonographic feature of malignant disease, which doesn't mean that we are histologists, but this is a central hepatic tumor. Uh, all of us know that we will not reach for the microscope, MRI sometimes hopes for that with molecular imaging. We hope for a lot of uh, detailed diagnosis, but as macromorphologists, we are here in this webinar, we cannot foresee the histology, but we could suggest it. In the middle of the liver, everything is dilated here. What could that be? What would be the first differential diagnosis? Uh, there's one suggestion. Uh Coral angiocarcinoma, and another one is saying it could be a bile duct tumor. Yeah. Common bile duct tumor as well. Yeah. So it's the second home run. So the how is this famous uh, tournament? 
where they are catching for the balls in the United States. I don't know. A super no, it's super Bowl. Super Bowl. Super Bowl. No, I don't know. No, that's football. That's a different. That's different. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I mean football. Ah, yeah. Okay. You mean oh, my home run is baseball. Home run is baseball. Sorry, we are we are from okay. Austria. We we are not very international in sports by by this uh, by this uh, tricky thing. We are football players <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but uh, predominantly we are on skis, but there are not too many ski signs, so <laughs> we have to import them. I'm happy uh, about this diagnosis. This is Colangia cellular carcinoma, and uh, it is associated with some diseases, and it is so rare as that what you may find in the in in, in your uh, practical life. Uh, but anyway, it is interesting to uh, to look for the predisposing uh, diseases like the primary sclerosing uh, cholangitis, um, then uh, common bile duct cysts, that means uh, also uh, inherited problems, then uh, those uh, incredible complicated uh, inflammatory diseases, we really don't know exactly why they are there. The Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, that are the university diseases. They, are, they play a very dominant role in imaging because they can make so many problems. And uh, one of them could be, in very poor patients, this bad prognostic uh, situation of a col uh, cholangiocellular carcinoma. As well, familial uh, polyposis could lead to that. Um, the cholangiocellular carcinoma uh, is like the gallbladder carcinoma with an extremely poor prognosis. As well, CT, MRCP, ERCP, they, they uh, depict it beautifully uh, as a tumor, but we, we see cases where the, it appears as the so called clad skin tumor, where you have not too much mass around it and it is growing within the duct. And the differential diagnosis is hepatoma, for, could be lymphoma or whatever, if you have an angiosarcoma or what else, malignant or a huge metastasis, if it is with aggressive growth. But uh, it is suggestive, suggestive if a huge central tumor is combined uh, with dilated ducts. And here a graphic from our book, you don't have to remind those types of clad skin tumors, but they have different ways to grow. And uh, in former years, a huge field of development, now uh, already uh, routine, is the interventional radiology of uh, such lesions, where a transhepatic approach of a, of a wire, and then a stent can be placed uh, to bring the bile down. Uh, to the duodenum again, and this uh, drainage, the art of drainage, is something for centers dealing with those tumors. And here is the documentation of uh, a successful drainage of uh, such a tumor. Did we have something in the chat? No, at the moment not. Okay. Now we are uh, tired, it's summertime, it is later and later, and now we have to go back to the easy case. But easy doesn't mean that it is a nice disease, it is just something you should keep as something difficult for sonography. And this is uh, an icterus in a 65 year old male, and you do the sonography. And what is visible here? We have three suggestions already to pancreatic tumors, dilated DHC with tumor in distal DHC, uh, dilated common bile duct due to mass in the uh, most uh, peripheral part, peripheral part close to the denome wall, could be mass in pancreas. Okay, let's have a look to this. 
This is, I have to confess, not exactly the same patient. And here we have a CT image of it, a CT example. And we have again a strong colleagues in the audience. So there are more panelists uh, than, uh, than learners, but maybe some of our contribution will teach them too, but they help uh, the uh, colleagues who are not so common with sonography much more to, to reach uh, education. So this, we are very thankful for these quick and true commands. So this is a some centimeter measuring hypoechoic mass. This, uh, in fact, is the very short uh, little structure. And here something which is gray but dark. And if you see it in dynamic, well, you would see that this is fluid. This is hypoechoic, almost like this. And this is the dilated bile duct. Then this is the hepatic artery. And this is the portal vein. And this is always the same. You have to get uh, you have to get used to this view. We were showing it uh, in the in the standard sections, the very important view, and then following uh, the uh, following these structures to the pancreatic head, we see here this mass, this little mass, two or three centimeters. And here is CT, it depicts uh, in the reconstruction uh, the same type of lesion. We have here the duodenum, here we have the liver with uh, around little masses, and here a tumor in the more distal uh, part of the pancreatic head, the uncinate process, and both of them, the first shown the sonographic ones. Yeah. Uh, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, as suggested. There's a question. Yeah. Uh, it says, is this a double duct sign? The double duct sign would mean that we have the bile duct and the panc pancreatic duct, and we don't see the pancreatic duct in this image. Double duct would be, uh, is this is a classical sign for MRCP, uh, where you have the, the, the pancreatic duct and the bile duct uh, dilated. 20% uh, of uh, these uh, of, of uh, diagnosed pancreatic carcinomas uh, are resectable on those places where this diagnostic workup is fast and well organized and the five-year survival remains poor with 25% overall. Um, we have a question regarding uh, a slide earlier, uh, and it says, how do you know with sonography where the cholangiocellular cellular carcinoma is coming from? Uh, I will not be able, uh, in the most of the cases, to define it. I can suggest it when uh, a huge tumor or a tumor is fitting to the topographic side of the bile ducts, of the central bile ducts, in the division of the portal uh, portal vein. Usually, uh, in cholangiocellular carcinoma as a huge liver tumor, in the most of the cases, uh, we, we fail the diagnosis as a sonographer and suggest a huge hepatic tumor. But this example, of course, is a beautiful one, which uh, one might see uh, rarely, but it is uh, it is an, more an example than that what you will meet in your uh, in your practical life. Okay. You wanted to comment on the last image? Well, perhaps I, I just want to say that the difficulty in this case lies to um, to realize where the anatomy is. Where is the liver? Where is the uh, ligament with the portal vein, the artery, and the bile duct? So 
you're not common with standard patterns, uh, you are like lost, you don't know which instruction goes with another. But if you recognize that this is the oblique view, um, the right upper quadrant for the portal vein, and um, the other structures of the ligament, then uh, you directly find that there is something pathologic uh, like this mass we've shown you. So maybe we have a look at the pancreas uh, to show a little bit more exactly what Alexander now is uh, explaining us. This is a good image showing us the, the relation in an ideal way. Where we have here the uncinate process, we have the pancreatic head, and we have here the gallbladder. And here we have the confluence uh, exactly where the superior mesenteric vein divides into, into the vena leal malis and uh, into the portal vein. And, uh, you have to be familiar with this uh, magic area of the upper abdomen where you can see here the, the aorta and here uh, the cava and here the uh, superior mesenteric artery surrounded by fat. Maybe you could explain us this here in the CT. Um, well, we have a look first myself. <laughs> I've not come from the pictures, but we see the normal pancreas in, um, in the left picture, um, where you can see the, the lobular structure, which is normal. You can see the small uh, pancreas duct, and uh, you see the arrow on the left side, um, where it's the uh, Bile duct. And what do we have on the right side? Let me have a look. Okay, this is just a reconstruction um, where we see the complete uh, pancreatic duct in, in a whole uh, row. And we see that it's just one or two millimeters um, from, from the diameter, which is normal. If it's dilated, then it could be, for example, one or two centimeters. And if you see the uh, common bile duct 2 um, going to the liver and the dilated pancreatic duct, then we have the double duct sign, which we will ask before. Okay. So this is a complicated anatomy and it is worthwhile uh, to, uh, to train it. It's very important in your practical life. Here we see an ER ERCP showing us the pancreatic duct. And I think we return now to, uh, to our case. Uh, if a pancreatic uh, carcinoma can be resected, uh, it, if it's in the tail, then we have a left resection of the pancreas. If it is in the head, uh, we can uh, show here the Wittles operation where uh, firstly they do a billiard situation, uh, but additionally they uh, resect uh, here the bile duct together with the pancreatic head and the tumor and, uh, and the small intestine. And then they recover the situation by doing uh, an anastomosis and hepatogegenostomy and then a pancreatical jejunostomy, and here we have the loop and the brown anastomosis uh, down uh, for uh, for better communication of uh, the of the uh, of the juices. And uh, this is of course uh, a very difficult operation for centers and the post-operative follow-up of those patients is classically done with CT, which is uh, quick available, and here the radiation problem doesn't play uh, the role. So, we are not too far to the end of the webinar, and uh, as I was, um, I was telling you in the beginning of the webinar, this time we want to have the quiz just now, and so we would like uh, to ask you, be quick, concentrate the last minutes, 
these are easy cases. <coughs> we have four prices. This is one big clinical textbook. It's three, uh, three uh, books of uh, clinical sonography, the introduction books of Alexander Sachs. I will show you. Maybe you want to comment to the, the book. I like the book especially because it was done uh, it was done when uh, Alexander was a student so he was so very near education that he did it really on the basis and uh, he is also performing courses on the European uh, Society of Radiology they adopted his teaching system so he is uh, a little bit a sonography star and I'm happy to have him here uh, as the as the young blood of this webinar, so you would comment a little bit about the sense of uh, of your book because this is a prize for three people just to make them much more interested to win <laughs> because the fast will win. Yeah, it's yeah. easy cases, but the fast. Yeah, that's a good entrance to the book because it's if you read the book and follow its. Uh, its rules or pages, then you have a fast entry to um, ultrasound too. So I think it's a very nice book to, if you have the first steps in ultrasound, if you like to get to know the standard patterns on, on abdominal ultrasound, uh, how is the anatomy, how to make a good picture, and uh, you see here how, how we constructed the pages where you always have the uh, image, how to hold the probe, and of course in the ultrasound image, and then with um, certain numbers and uh, configurations, which organ, which structure is seen in the picture. And uh, we focus there on the practical part, so uh, there are um, as many books uh, as I know for the theoretical part, and here it's like you have the first practice entry into um, Alverson. And yeah, go for it, be fast. <laughs> and. Uh... The textbook you already know. This is our backbone orientation uh, for our student webinar, and I think I will uh, explain you. So the very quick will have seen the uh, the, the uh, picture, the images already. But the first, uh, the first people who have all the three cases uh, in a correct setting are on the winner list. And so there are four people who may get the prizes. So let us go to the simple quick case one. What is this? Be careful, okay. be careful. But Alex, don't, don't. I want to help. This no. Don't tell. Now this is really a anonymous chat. I would like to see what, what they are writing, because we should give a minute for each case. Huh? Well, actually, we, we could help a bit with where the shot was taken, which anatomy you see. Perhaps just as a, as a hint, it's it not recognized now. This is the liver. I show you the border of the liver here. This structure, um, I suppose, might be the gallbladder in a cross sectional view. You see that because it's nearly round shaped. And um, the rest of the picture is not that interesting in the moment. Uh, more interesting is what you see in the gallbladder, and this is, of course, the basis of your diagnosis. So, I think we are ready to go to the next, to the next case. Be very careful. It comes from the family of differential diagnosis we had already, so Maybe some of you could suggest even the name, but it's not exactly that easy than it looks from the first view. What is? Let's make a book. Yeah. And 
I have to go to the chat. Again, for the normal anatomy, perhaps you see the liver again, it's the right upper quadrant. We have a certain oblique view where we see the uh, patodurodenic ligament. And um, here, not to speak of the pathology you see in the picture, we have two structures here one is in the above uh, part, one is lower, which might be portal vein and common bile duct. Unfortunately, we don't have a diameter, but I would suppose this is just five to seven centimeters, so we're quite near the probe. I would like to suggest uh, how the chat is running. Uh, always think, always think uh, in differential diagnosis. Uh, I was uh, I was mentioning the name of of this term, but uh, we do not uh, expect that if you say exactly, suggest exactly what it is. Always be differential diagnostic in your thinking. Because tumor, inflammation, all of those things are very difficult to differentiate. But good suggestions are around. Good suggestions are around. And yeah, there are also there are also good. I think I see the correct diagnosis was done. Colleague as well. So now we are going again the same road. What is that? Uh, maybe uh, Alexander. Is this is it not a tough one? Of course, it's a tough one. We are not pathologists. It's a quiz, and we want to bet. We if we bet on horses, <laughs> then it's also. A little bit uh, a luck to uh, right. If I would be the sonographer of this case, I would not give the correct diagnosis for 90 or 95 percent. But if the clinical setting helps me, I could suggest it maybe in 70 or 85 percent. You could suggest if you know about the patient a lot. What I do not like to give you too much minutes. It would be too easy. So. Uh, one might, one might uh, suggest also the anatomy. It's very important. So we help a little bit. This is the right liver. This is the pancreatic corpus. This is the part of the pancreatic tail. We very often can see this is the upper pole of the left kidney. This is the upper pole of the right kidney. So this is a rare view from the quality, a good quality. Why the patient is so transmitting? Uh, why we can see so much of this patient. Could be two, th three factors. One is individual uh, persons. There are some even very fat persons. You, you have an excellent sonographic quality. That's slim persons without any gas. Or body edema. There are types of, uh, of, of anasaka where you see uh, very beautifully everything. But not all of them. So it's, Difficult question. Well, I think we should help. In the first case, it was cholesterolosis. This is a benign disorder we find in up to 5% of the patients, and it looks like normal stones, but it is not. Uh, it's not movable. Uh, these little round polypoid structures are uh, adherent to the wall. And uh, for our kind of quiz, we are we are not um, uh, we are not the court of radiology here. So I accept polyposis because it's a kind of polyposis, but this is not uh, adenomas, uh, multiple adenomas. Uh, adenomas of the gallbladder are very rare. Usually, five percent of the people have cholesterolosis, and this is a P9 entity. And there is a general, if you have only one of it, or two, some might say, hey, it could be an adenoma and a gallbladder carcinoma. So at last, overall, the common sense says that if it is less or equal one centimeter, you can follow up it. 
And if they are multiple and small, usually nobody follows them up. I think so. So there is not really a hard standard like pirates in breast image. Do you like to comment on that? I think that's a very clear image. Um, if you have localized that this is the gallbladder, and if you see that it's like um, multiple you know, polyp polyps, they're like become very fast to diagnose. I think it's a good image. Yeah. So now we come to the Miritsi syndrome. I am very happy that we had a, a, a straightforward uh, colleague. Uh, who was uh, remembering that syndrome from his knowledge? Maybe it's a radiologist or a very, uh, a very trained, good trained student. But nevertheless, it's the Miritsi syndrome, which is very difficult to differentiate from gallbladder carcinoma in many cases. And here you see a drawing, which is more exemplaric than true because. Usually, the gallbladder lumen in the Miritsi syndrome is not uh, any more visible. What you see is uh, a shadow of, uh, of stone, and then uh, you have uh, the dilation of the bile ducts. Here, you see the compression of the proximal bile duct in the Miritsi syndrome, where a very old and famous surgeon told me in the elevator to the, uh, of the clinic. Uh, I love the radiologists if they tell me if it's a Miritsi or a gallbladder carcinoma before I operate, because when I operate, I don't even know. <laughs> so the pathologists often is really necessary. So macromorphologic, even if you look at it, often you cannot uh, you cannot uh, depict the difference. So I would suggest to be more intellectual uh, and to have a good reputation in an operating theater. Don't say. I would more suggest Miritsi, even if you have the idea, just be open, don't tell too much. Well, now we are uh, here around the acute pancreatitis. I did not speak about alcohol and the male in the, in the right social situation where you, you, uh, you uh, expect that disease. But usually you will expect that because most people suffering from um, uh, from uh, alcohol, uh, they present in the right uh, in the right outlook when they are in the age to present with acute pancreatitis, which is not so often seen in the very young uh, drinkers. So you see people who have a career and then. If you see it with sonography, if you are quicker than the CT or if you don't have CT, it's very valuable to focus on the pancreas. And of course, the CT is the, uh, the state of art, uh, the state of art method, because here we see not only the enlargement of the pancreatic head in CT, also we can see the edema and also the uh, involvement of the surrounding structures. But you would like to comment on. Well, I think it's beautiful to compare uh, ultrasound and CT here because it shows the same structures. You see the liver very beautiful here on the left side of the picture, and also, like um, Peter already said, the the kidneys on both sides. So this image has a, a depth of probably 12 to 15 centimeters. Um, and what what we can recognize actually, even if the picture is worse, we can see the superior mesenteric artery with the hyperechoic surrounding, which is very clearly in the middle of the picture. And you know, if you know the normal anatomy, you know the pancreas is around it, and um, usually shouldn't look like that. So with the clinics together, we could get very good diagnosis. Okay, there's a question coming in uh, yeah. saying, how do you uh, know that this isn't uh, that this isn't a tumor? I do not know that this is not a tumor. Uh, from the image, this could be a huge pancreatic tumor, uh, but uh, problem uh, problem is that in such middle echogenic masses, uh, a chronic pancreatitis is uh, difficult to differentiate. This is a big problem even for uh, MRI and of course for uh, computer tomography as well. And uh, this has to be investigated carefully. And 
MRCP, CT of the pancreas, of the liver, MRI, uh, are needed to suggest it in a, a better accuracy. So from this image, we cannot. Thank you very much. Bye. And we'll see on the, in September fresh again.